Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today, we got some pretty fascinating stories. First up, Ethereum whales accumulate in anticipation of ETH 2.0 and why I believe this is one of those coins that is going to go to the moon during the next bull run. Also, the RBI, or Reserve Bank of India, files petition to review the Supreme Court's crypto ruling just two days ago as Indian exchanges resume fiat deposits and why, and why the only individuals who are actually at risk here is the RBI also. On the heels of the India decision, also by the South Korean decision, here we have another example of regulation where Bitcoin is now considered a legal form of currency, French court rules, and why everything is falling into line as far as regulation for this next big bull run we're going to see in 2020-2021. And Coinbase CEO says Bitcoin may lose cryptocurrency race to altcoins. Here's why. So for all you Bitcoin maxis, get ready to blow up the comments section. And finally, let's go over the scam of the day. First, I wanna say thanks to everybody who has contributed to the scam of the day. Getting rid of these scammers helps us a lot, but we will go over that at the very last section after these stories, so let's dive right in. So first up, Ethereum whales accumulate in anticipation of ETH 2.0. And this really isn't a, isn't, a, isn't a surprise to anyone, I believe. I mean, there's a huge amount of accumulation going on right now. Now that we're kind of treading sideways as far as the market goes but there was an interesting part to this because it is going to talk about ETH 2.0 why it's so important and actually how many wallets are really in control of everything so it says here whales appear to be accumulating ether with the percentage of ETH supply controlled by the top 100 wallets standing near 25 percent imagine that 100 wallets are taking over 25 percent that is a massive amount of accumulation in a very small amount of space. So it says here, many of the 20 largest wallets are owned by exchanges. So out of those 100, 20 are by places like Huobi, Binance, Bitfinex, Poloniex, OKX, Gemini, KuCoin, and the list goes on. And they hold roughly 18.5 million ETH combined, equating to about 17% of ETH's total supply. Now, whales may be accumulating in anticipation that the Ethereum or ETH 2.0 revamp may drive another bull season for the second largest crypto by market cap. So not to beat a dead horse or go over this entire article because a lot of it's just a bunch of TA. And if you're in a TA, fantastic. I'll leave a, a link for you guys to dissect and look over all that and the charts and whatnot. But uh, for me, what is most important here is that we're taking a look at what smart money is doing. And smart money, it's not about what people say, but it's what they are doing. And in the background, you can see major accumulation going on. And so I find this fascinating because I tend to look at what not the masses are doing, but the, what the small one, two, three percent of the population is actually doing in this space to accumulate and potentially become rich or I guess richer in this in this situation. And the big thing that I was the, the question I have was, what's ETH 2.0? I mean, we hear about all these things about Ethereum coming out. ETH is going to, you know, revamp the whole game and, and just come out as a whole new blockbuster. So what exactly is it? So I took a look at the uh, at ethhub.io. I'll link this in the description as well. And not to go over the whole thing, because I would take way too long for this video. I just broke it down in some bite-sized pieces. So real quick, it's important to understand that this upgrade or upgrade to ETH 2.0 will not take place at a single point in time. Instead, it'll be rolled out in phases. So as opposed to like a fork where, it's, where people say it's gonna happen on this date uh, and then everything happens, this is gonna be like two or three different phases. So the I like how they laid it out because they had you know their design goals. It wasn't just like, well, let's just do this one little thing and then we'll move on. So first of all, they had goals and these five things made a lot of sense to me. First of all, they want to talk about decentralization to make it even more decentralized uh, to have any system level validation such as the beacon chain or to allow for even a typical consumer la laptop with resources to process or validate these shards. And we'll get to that in a second. Resilience to remain live when very large portions of the nodes go offline. So it's not just like one and done. They can have, you know, they can have 100, 1,000, 10,000 or however many they need to and they are resilient to anything that could happen. So great. Security allows for a large participation of validators in total and per unit time. And this is the big one. Uh, I think some people won't like this, but I like this because as far as mass adoption goes, you need simplicity. 
we need people to come into this space and be like, what the heck is all this? This is like speaking Greek. So they said, look, we're, gonna, we're going to minimize complexity even at the cost of some losses in efficiency. And I think that's a smart move because we want people to be able to come in here and be like, oh, this is easy. Oh, this is blockchain? I don't even realize this is blockchain. And then boom, mass adoption happens. And lastly, it talks about longevity. Components uh, such that they are either quantum secure or can be easily swapped out for quantum secure counterparts. And it looks like they're really looking down the road as far as quantum. I don't know if this is quantum computing or what's what it is. I don't even pretend to, to, to uh, realize what this is, but I do like how they have the foresight to look 5, 10, maybe 15 years on the road. So here's the phases. Phase zero, the beacon chain. The beacon chain will manage the Casper proof of stake protocol for itself and all of the shard chains. So if you're not aware, Ethereum is going from proof of work to proof of stake. So they are getting away from all this computational power and electricity and just have people stake it and that is how everything's going to run moving on. Great, so beacon chain. ETH2, the new ether. Phase zero will introduce ETH2, which will be a new asset for stakers or validators to be used on the beacon chain. Again, no more proof of work, validators, proof of stake. It will be created using two methods as a reward, reward for validating the beacon chain uh, and shards or you can purchase it for one ETH by any ETH one point blank user, such as myself, which I will be rolling everything over to ETH2. Moving on, it says, once phase zero is complete, there will be two active Ethereum chains. This was interesting to me. I'm like, hmm, why do they have two chains? And then so they said, for the sake of clarity, let's call them the ETH1 chain, which is the current proof of work, and the ETH2 chain, the new beacon chain. So not to get into the weeds, they're going to have them both going at the same time until they move everything over to the ETH2 or the proof of stake. And then uh, this was the big one because I had always heard this number and no one could really pin, pin it down. But it says here, to become a validator, you'll need to stake 32 ETH2. So essentially, if you've got 32 ETH right now, you just transfer those over, those over to 32, 32 ETH or ETH2, and you can be a validator. So that is the magic number. If you do not have Ethereum, um, I have plenty. <laughs> I have enough, I would say. And uh, if you don't have it, I would say that it's a good, It's it would behoove you. That's what we always say in the Army. It would behoove you to educate yourself on Ethereum, especially right now, that it is an undervalued asset. I mean, it is so low as far as what it used to be. Uh, I think the all-time high was around 1400. Now we're looking at 220, 240. I mean, that's uh, that's a lot. So if you get your hands on that, why not? Uh, also, it says during phase zero, all user transactions and smart contract computations will st still occur on a liqueur occur on the ETH one chain. So. As this all rolls out into phase one, everything will be two different chains. So phase one is the shard chains. So shard chains are the key to future scalability. What are shards? So instead of having a node with all the data uh, for all of the ETH chain, what they're gonna do is sharding refers to splitting the entire Ethereum network into multiple portions called shards. And each shard would contain its own independent state meaning a unique, a unique set of account balances and smart contracts, i.e. a shard of the total. So instead of you, know, you having all the different, like let's say the Bitcoin blockchain, right? If you download the whole Bitcoin uh, blockchain onto your node, correct? To run a node. Well here, uh, as time goes on, you're not gonna have to do that. You're just gonna have to have a shard of a shard of a shard or a percentage, I suppose, if you wanna make it even simpler. So yeah, and that'll make things uh, speed up a little bit faster and uh, hopefully it works out. <laughs> Moving on, it says in phase zero, one, and two, the main proof of work chain or ETH1 will remain live while testing and transitioning is happening on the ETH2 chain. This means that rewards will be paid to both Ethereum 2.0 validators as well as the normal POW block rewards. So that's interesting. I don't know how that's gonna work. Like if you have, if you're holding, I mean, if you're holding both, obviously, right? But if you're holding Ethereum 1, would you also get paid for the Ethereum 2? Or would you have to transfer them over? I'm not for sure. But if it is, this would be where it gets interesting because it says, therefore, the combined inflation of the two chains may spike initially, but then start to trend upwards or trend towards the 0 to 1% range as the POW chain is gradually de-emphasized. 
And that's pretty much the whole thing in a nutshell. So they're gonna make things simpler. That's a great thing. They're gonna kind of condense everything. They're gonna have shards. They're gonna go from proof of work to proof of stake. And I, for one, can understand exactly why smart money is, tr is starting to really um, accumulate Ethereum at a massive amount. Moving on. Next up, the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, files petition to review Supreme Court's ruling. And I got to tell you, once you understand how bad this could be for RBI, you're going to realize that they are in, they're in trouble. So two days ago, the Supreme Court overturned the Reserve Bank of India's cryptocurrency ban after determining that the decision was unconstitutional. And this is big news. I was listening to uh, BitBoy. If you haven't listened to BitBoy, that guy's got a great channel. He has got the best backgrounds in the game. This guy, uh, he's really he's really good, really knowledgeable, takes a look at uh, coins outside the top 100. And uh, he's a good channel. I, I, I recommend him. He's in my uh, description, so check him out. But uh, he was just, you know, breaking it down. He's like, look, he goes, you have to understand that in India, I mean, of course, there's 1.3 billion people plus, uh, but also that is a huge country that has to do with technological advances, has to do with people who are fantastic at coding, has to do a lot with the internet and these, these types of online jobs and things that they do technologically. And they were just shut out. They were just shut out for uh, to buy cryptocurrency digital assets. And it's it was a shame. And it wasn't like uh, in America where, you know, some banks would shut off your accounts. It was like, if you do this, you're going to jail, which is insane to me to think about. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, thank God it happened. So, and hopefully that will drive the market up. I believe it will. Moving on, it says, however, the Reserve Bank of India is planning to appeal to the Supreme Court's decision. Apparently, the central bank is worried that India's banking system could be at risk if cryptocurrency trading is allowed. Well, if that's not the biggest duh statement of all time, then yeah, duh. Of course, it's going to put them at risk. Look, the banks suck. They just do. Um, I had to, you know, not too long ago, go step into my bank uh, because I tr was trying to do a transfer to one of my distributors, which I am in Texas. They are in Arizona. It's not like it's a very, f you know, far distance. First of all, it took three days because it was over the weekend. I went there on a Friday. Second of all, I had to get their permission because it was, it was a large amount of uh, funds and they didn't like that. So I had to go in there and explain my situation. And they had to take a review and it was just a bunch of BS. And I'm like, you know, you're really costing me time and time is money. And I don't pay you guys to, you know, make me slower. I pay you, I pay the bank, I pay the fees on these things for it, you guys to, to, to make things fast and you guys suck at it. Like, well, sorry, sir. Da, da, da. I'm like, you know what? This is why you guys are going to go out of business at one point. And the same thing is true here for, for the RSI. I mean, look, they know, they see the writing on the wall. They're like, what can we do that cryptocurrency can't do? Nothing. And actually, there is a huge advantage to using it. So, of course, they're going to appeal this because once this goes down for one billion plus people, we'll see what happens with that reserve bank. Anyhow, uh, talks about exchanges. Mumbai-based crypto exchange Coin DCX was the first to add bank account transfers just hours after the ban, after the ban was removed, and they sent a little nice little tweet saying, "Hey, look, see, Coin DCX integrates with a bank, which is so weird to see here in the U.S. or if you're in Europe or if you're in Australia or wherever you're at. You're like integrate with a bank. Well, they all do that. No, <laughs> not in India. Definitely not in China. So it's just good to see. And then." Uh, Wazir X, which was, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you guys will, uh, I think Wazir X was uh, purchased by Binance. So what a great move by Binance, right? To you know pick up an exchange in India before the ban was lifted. And then you know, here they are, boom, right in the right place, right time. Good foresight. So uh, Wazir X says, it's been a long enduring battle, but crypto has won. You have won. After a long wait of 19 months. I and I are deposits are enabled on Wazirx. 19 months. Imagine. If you I mean you can you can make as much money as you want to, right? It's a it's a free and open society. But you can only you can't spend it on this thing because we say you can't. Well, why can't I? Because we said you can't. Well, why? Well, because it might hurt our business. So you're telling me that I can't use my harder money and pay for this product 
just because it's going to affect you? That's not my problem. That's a you problem. However, that's exactly what happened for 19 months, and they had to wait until the Supreme Court struck it down. So here's, here's where it gets interesting. The cryptocurrency ban had seriously crippled crypto operations in India with volumes ebbing away with each passing day. Moreover, moreover an inter-ministerial group had suggested a complete ban of cryptocurrencies in India earlier last year. The panel also recommended hefty fines and imprisonment for anyone caught dealing with digital assets. I mean, what are they talking about? I mean, is it like you're just moving heroin around? It's cryptocurrencies for Pete's sakes, but these guys were really going after them. And you have to understand the mentality, right? They look at it like, wow, this could really affect our business. Let's ban it. So, yeah. Uh, the last part here is where I understand it to be that the RBI is in serious trouble. So as per the rules put in place by the Supreme Court, petitions for reviews should be filled not more than 30 days after the verdict is given, which is why they're going to uh, submit that appeal form. But unless the bank sufficiently proves that cryptocurrency operations hinder the growth of banks, it is likely that the Supreme Court will not change its ruling on Wednesday. And I can tell you, it's not like the, the, R, um, the RBI had a shortage of money to pay their lawyers to fight this in court. You know that they came heavy with everything that, that they could put into it to make sure that they got a positive outcome and didn't go their way because it wasn't right. So now for them to submit anything, I mean, what are the chances that it could? I don't think there is a snowball's chance in hell it's going to happen, but you never know. But uh, they probably shot their wad right in the very beginning, and if they didn't get it in the first try, the second try is not going to go easy. And here's where I think that they are going to be scrawed. So, in fact, the central bank could be in legal trouble. One attorney representing a cryptocurrency firm noted that several cryptocurrency firms in India went bankrupt following RBI's ban. As such, they could now seek legal action against the bank now that the Supreme Court overturned the ban. So, after all that information, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? And do you think this is a, a, uh, a bad situation for the RBI to be in? Do you think this is going to get overturned? Let me know in the comments section. Let's move on. More proof of mass adoption coming. Bitcoin is a legal form of currency. French court rules. So the French court makes a landmark ruling on the cryptocurrency field as Bitcoin is described as a fungible, intangible asset Equating the, equating the top crypto to fiat currency. So essentially, uh, fungible versus non-fungible. Uh, fungible means it is exchangeable uh, with whatever type of fiat you have. Non-fungible token is it's really not exchangeable uh, whatsoever. And you can see these in like gaming situations. Uh, crypto Kitties, I think, would be a great example. But I did a video on uh, fungible versus non-fungible. I'll link at the very end. But um, this is, I mean, the whole article just says essentially the, the same thing but what's amazing to me i just want to make mention that this came after the japan decision then we moved into the india decision then we had the south korea decision now we have the french decision here so and they've all been positive legally so this is like a major gift to the cryptocurrency community. And all on top of that, plus there is a Bitcoin having come up, having coming up in about two months, around May 2020. And all these things are in place. And then also on top of that, in the next six months to a year or so, there are going to be 21 different bills going before the US Congress related to cryptocurrency and how they are going to uh, poise themselves or position themselves. And it's uh, looking very positive all the way throughout as far as like uh, the legal wise, regulation wise, and then the actual uh, monetary wise as far as the bull run coming up. Because, I mean, just looking at uh, the stock to flow ratio and, and different things with this, uh, with, with the halving, if you look to the past, at all points of this time. And with all these things coming in place, it's like, what else do you need to know? But moving on this article, it says, Hubert du Vauplain, lawyer Kramer and Levin, believes the decision gives Bitcoin similar capabilities to fiat currencies and other financial instruments such as stocks. He said, the scope of this decision is considerable because it allows Bitcoin to be treated like money or other financial instruments. And we're going to see that type of thing 
you're going to see the big financial players. Like we've, like we've already seen Fidelity. We've always seen TD Ameritrade and Vanek. But different banks, different organizations are also going to get into it as far as like the things that they can do, such as like custody, uh, digitizing assets. This is going to be a big thing. And then he also states uh, it will therefore facilitate Bitcoin transactions such as lending or repo transactions, which are growing and thus favor the liquidity of the cryptocurrency market. So let me know what you guys think in the comments section. Is this a slam dunk win for digital assets and cryptocurrency or is this just one more thing that's not going to move the needle whatsoever? But then in the comments below, let's move on to our last story. This one is interesting. This Brian Armstrong, who's the Coinbase CEO, has really been on a tear lately. And this is just one more thing that he talks about. Um, it was just in a series of tweets, and I don't know what's got into that guy, but uh, he makes sense. So before I move on, let me just say I'm biased. Um, here's what I invested in. Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, EOS, Cardano, and Chainlink. So when I, when I talk about these projects, it's because... As much as I try to be uh, fair and balanced and impartial, it's very tough because I have invested in these things. So even when I try to be unbiased, you have to know that deep, deep down, I really am biased. But uh, this article made me sit up and think and really go, what the heck's going on? And it made a lot of sense. So Brian Armstrong, one of his tweets says, look, at Netscape, which if you're old like me, you're older. I, I, I'm not old. I feel old. But if you're older, at Netscape, I remember Netscape, they were working with early internet protocols. Things weren't very scalable, like dial-up modems. You had to be somewhat technical to figure out how to get online. And early websites were pretty basic. Static sites looked like toys. And let me tell you, he's, he's right. In the very early days of internet sucked. Yeah, I mean, just to like, just to, you kids don't know, but to download one picture of anything would take like, you would just see it like download line by line by line. That was an image, not a video. For, for, forget about the videos. But it was pretty awful. And then, of course, now that we, you know, here we are in 2020, I mean, look, things happen at the speed of light, essentially. And it's amazing to me that I can send a, an email to somebody in Switzerland and, uh, and they'll get it within like 30 seconds. However, I can't move my money from Texas to Arizona. It takes me three days. Are you kidding me? Anyhow. So he talks about sound familiar crypto at all? Yeah, because that's how it is right now as far as money goes. They figured they'd try making a shopping cart, see if they could build a first party app. There was no way to save state or create session. For instance, like making a shopping cart, so they create a concept of cookies. Then the next problem was that nobody wanted to put a credit card on the internet because everything plain text over HTTP. So they went and invented SSL HTTPS. And I remember when people said, you bought something online, are you crazy? You know what's going to happen to your credit card? Well, first they're going to take that credit card and they're going to use that to fund terrorism <laughs> and, and buy drugs. It was the same thing as, as cryptocurrency. It was hilarious. Uh, Armstrong says that just as early internet uh, users came up with better web tools, the 11-year-old cryptocurrency industry is also gearing up towards new solutions. Slow internet speeds, dial-up modems reflect early challenges in scaling blockchains. Some blockchains are very slow. SSL and HTTPS are similar to some of the privacy coin offers, and that's what we need, HTTPS, SSL, certificates for privacy. And I thought about this. I'm like, this makes total sense. And here's a great video that illustrates that. These are the biggest dot-com companies from 1998 to 2019. I'm going to speed this up in a double speed. We're going to go over this real quick. But some of these, does anybody recognize these? I mean, you, Amazon, which was there from the very beginning, but it wasn't the biggest. And uh, that's the market cap, one billion eight hundred eleven million one hundred sixteen thousand. Here's the one billion. It's a Bezos makes I think in a day. So let's take a look. I'm just gonna shut the sound off. I don't care. But yeah, you can see this Yahoo, Netscape, and look, Netscape was the first. It was crushing everybody, and then gone. No one knows what that is now. Amazon was doing well, came all the way up, but now there's Yahoo, Yahoo, which totally. Uh, overreached and they fell amazon's still up there going up and down like do you remember any of these websites anybody i remember booking.com that's about it ebay ebay beat amazon for pete's sakes one thing i want to i'll have you note though is that you see how amazon this was 2001 see how it's kind of in this third fourth fifth position it's because they were making moves they were 
They were buying all these types of companies. They were making acquisitions and mergers. They were hiring the best and the brightest people because they knew that this was going to be big. So they wanted to get the best people around them and they wanted to make this a real business instead of just kind of shooting their load all in the beginning. And uh, it paid off because as you're going to see as time goes on, oh, here's Google. Remember them? <laughs> Remember them? They're all over the place and they came out of nowhere. And then here's Netflix, which was up here and now it slides down. What's Netflix? Well, around this time is when they actually, Netflix, a little funny little story. Netflix went to uh, Blockbuster and said, hey, uh, do you want to buy us? And Blockbuster's like, why the hell would we do that? You're just a flash in the pan. You'll be gone uh, next year. I think this was in 2003, 2004, if I, uh, can't, if I remember right. And uh, does anybody remember Blockbuster? Some of us do. Most of us don't. But yeah, here's Google up here. So if we think about it logically, I know I'm going to get a bunch of, uh, uh, of talk, but you have to understand something. And this is the rest of just the same, same stuff. What team are you on? What team are you on? Are you on team you or are you on team them? So you have to understand, for me personally, I am not married to any one of my six. If, uh, if they don't do well, I'm going to drop them. And uh, I got to tell you right now, I got my eye on Cardano. Not, do, not, not making me too... No, I'm sorry. Cardano, eh, EOS. I got my eye on EOS. Not real happy with them. I'm not married to any one project. And if someone comes to me and goes, hey, you know, this is not working. Here's another one. I'm like, sure, let's do it. I, I pick these six. Now, you have your whatever you have. That's fine. But you have to understand, you can't be married to your coin because then you have emotion into it. And when you have emotion into it, you make dumb mistakes. You just do. So what team are you on? Are you on your family's team where you're like, hey, um, I like this project. This is going to make good money. But if things change, I'm going to get out and I can be nimble because I'm an investor. Or are you someone who's like, you know what, this one, I'm ride or die. It doesn't matter what happens, good or bad, I'm going to hold it till the end until it goes down to zero. And for some people, that's what they want to do because that's just them or they have a little bit of money or whatever. For me, that's not the thing. I pick these six because this is what I believe is going to go up in the long term. However, you have to just think about it. What team are you on? Are you on team them or are you on team you? you and your your spouse and your kids who depend on you to make the right decisions. So just think about that. Anyhow, uh, so talking about this, I'm just going to tell you, uh, Bitcoin is, is old. It is an old technology, and it is the first one. And how many times have we seen where the first, I mean, you have first mover advantage, that is true. And the first thing that, that came out, comes out is the, is the best thing of all time. Look at like electric vehicles. There's a great documentary on Netflix. I think it's still there. It's called Who Killed the Electric Car? And uh, Tesla wasn't the first electric car. I mean, electric cars were, were around since I think the 60s, 70s, something like that. And those are gone. Now we can take a look at just this, the biggest dot-com companies. No one knows Netscape. Netscape doesn't exist. Same thing with all the rest of these. They're all gone. And uh, I mean, they had first mover advantage. They, they stuck around for a while, but eventually they fell off because as people come in, they want things that are simple. They want things that are easy. They want things that are fast. And if you give them all, and cheap, of course, and if you give them all those things, they're going to use them. So that's just how I see it. And I thought it was a very, I thought it was a good comment. Moving on. Uh, last two parts, it says, he says, for me, the biggest areas of development I see that I think we need to get right as an industry are one, scalability. We need blockchains that can get to at least thousands of TPS or transactions per second to get mainstream adoption of crypto, similar to broadband internet being a big unlock on the web. Privacy, perhaps a contrarian view, but I think we'll need privacy coins, just like we needed HTTPS as the default on the web for many use cases in crypto long term. Everyone deserves access to financial services and financial privacy. True. So I wasn't a big proponent of privacy coins, but I've kind of changed my tune a little bit. I do think we need privacy. I do think there's times when you have to have transactions that uh, should not be tracked or cannot be tracked. Um, and just to preface this, I am still going to hold Bitcoin. I believe hugely that Bitcoin is going to make a big play uh, in this 2020, 2021 uh, bull run. There's no doubt in my mind. It is on the tip of the tongue of all the big financial uh, planners, uh, the big institutions. So I have no problem with holding Bitcoin. 
Long term, not really that jazzed about it unless they start to make improvements. And it's right here, TPS, transactions per second. What is Bitcoin's TPS right now? Seven, 15, 20 TPS? Visa's got like 25,000. So think about that. So when everybody's talking about how Bitcoin can do this, getting into that, yeah, because there's a very small amount of people using for transactions. Now put that into like, oh, I don't know, India. And you got a billion people. You think that's going to happen? That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen right now. So we'll see what ha we'll see how it all shakes out. But that is just me. And then the last part here, and then we'll go to the scam of the day. Privacy. And I thought, yeah, you know, privacy. I'm not a big thing of uh, fan of M M uh, Monero because I don't think that the Monero is going to. I mean, apparently the technology is awesome. I used to have Monero. I just don't have it anymore. But I, I came across this article. This is from Bitcoin Cash, from Bitcoin.com. Nobody, head explode. Going to talk about Bitcoin Cash for a second. But I will say this. Bitcoin Cash, love it or hate it, it's still going to pump. It's still going to do well. And uh, when the next bull run comes around, you believe it's going to go. It's going to go up. I think it's totally undervalued too. But Bitcoin Cash is getting into, there's this thing called Cash Fusion, where it's a... Um, some type of app that you can use to hide your transactions, not hide your transactions. What's the word that they use? Uh, mask, I believe it is. Mask the transactions. And you can make them private. And this is on Bitcoin Cash. I thought it was pretty cool. And what they're doing is there is this project going around called Cash Fusion. They're looking for people to donate. If they donate uh, 50000 they will then um, match it and... Uh, make a $100,000 donation, and that will be the audit to make sure that this thing actually works great, and then they will roll it out. So interesting interesting times. I'm looking more into Bitcoin Cash. We'll see what happens. Uh, put your comments below if you love it or hate it and why you love it or hate it. That will be an interesting conversation for sure. Anyhow, that's it for the day. Thanks for sticking with me through the rants. Really appreciate it. If you got a couple more minutes, we're going to go over the scam of the day. Now, look. Scam today is super simple. If you're new to cryptocurrency, everything's a scam. That's all you got to know. Everything's a scam. If you don't think it's a scam, if you think Ripple's giving away money, uh, send them an email and just say, hey, you guys giving away free tokens? And they'll tell you no. If you think Binance is giving, air, giving airdrops, go to Binance. Go, are you giving away airdrops? No. Go to the official website, email them, take 24 hours. It'll save you a lot of heartache. Second, to get rid of these scams, uh, in, the, in the description of every one of my video, there's a link. It's going to say scam of the day. You're going to click on that link. It's going to take you this handy dandy Google spreadsheet. And there's just, eh, there's six now, but we got rid of all these. So thank you so much for everybody who was pitched in. Really appreciate it. The reason we're getting rid of these, because during this year, this bull run, we can't have people coming here and getting screwed over by the scammers because then they're going to tell their friend. One person tells 10, 10 tells 1,000 or 100 and then 1,000. And we want them to come in here feel safe, spend their money, make money, everybody's happy. So we need to get rid of these. So how do we do that? We're gonna click on this link. It's gonna take us to this nonsense here. And what we're we looking for? Well, first let's take a look in the comments section. Scamorama ding dong, this is a scam, 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 scam. Okay, so we think it's a scam. We don't know for sure, but let's take a look in the description. Sometimes the scam is in the video, but in this one, it's telling you something ridiculous. If you send a thousand XRP, you'll be airdrop ten thousand back, and blah 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 blah. It's just trash. So that's an asymmetrical giveaway. That is not how it works. Let's report them. So first, we're going to downvote. Second of all, we're going to click on these three dots and look for the report button. We're going to go to spam or misleading. Choose one, and it's going to be scams and fraud. And this applies the links, and just click next, and just say this is a scam, and that's all you got to do. So you don't have to leave your information or nothing like that. That's it, and you're done. So if you could do that for the other four or so, I'd really appreciate it. So thanks for helping out. Thanks for sticking with me to the very end. And um, if you like these types of videos, there's gonna be two more that are gonna pop up. Check them out, and I will see you on the next one.